Hello and welcome everyone to today's Scottish Drugs Forum webinar. Uh, I'm Dave Little, CEO of SDF, and I'll be chairing today's session, which will run no later than 20 past two. This is the ninth in a series of webinars focusing on the medication assisted treatment standards from one to 10. The aim of the webinars is threefold. Firstly, to continue to raise awareness of the standards across Scotland. Secondly, to highlight emerging good practice. And thirdly, to highlight challenges that remain with full implementation and how these may be addressed. Today, we'll be focusing on MAT standard nine, which is as follows. All people with co-occurring drug use and mental health difficulties can receive mental health care at the point of medication assisted treatment delivery. A link to the full standards is provided in the chat. By way of background, I thought it would be useful to recap on recent reports on this topic and also not so recent ones. The Mental Welfare Commission uh, for Scotland produced a report published in September last year called Ending the Exclusion, Care Treatment and Support for People with Mental Ill Health and Problem Substance Use in Scotland. One of the key uh, points in the report was the failure to implement guidance. The report highlighted uh, that services are not meeting the needs of people who have both mental ill health and problems with substance use. Strategy standards and guidelines are in place, but are not being translated into practice. The Scottish Government also produced a report in November last year, Drug and Alcohol Services Co-Occurring Substance Use and Mental Health Concerns, Literature and Evidence Review. And one of the key points made in that report was the issue long described as no wrong door, echoing prominent literature, policy literature, and the importance of open door policies for individuals with co-occurring substance use and mental health concerns was clear in the literature. This includes removing barriers in the form of abstinence requirements to access mental health services. So those were the recent reports. Um, and actually looking further back, we had in 2003, the Mind the Gap report meeting the needs of people with co-occurring substance use and mental health problems. And actually 2007, um, mental health in Scotland, closing the gaps, making a difference, uh, commitment 13. So I'm sure part of today's discussion will be on why progress has been so slow on this agenda and how we might um, change that in the future and move uh, more quickly. So moving on to the today's speakers, we've got four presentations. Firstly, Greg Hill O'Connor, Strategic Planning Advisor, Improvement Hub Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Secondly, Aaron Menon, Clinical Lead and Consultant Psychiatrist, Alcohol and Drug Recovery Services, NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Thirdly, Jan Mayer, Practice and Innovation Lead, Alcohol and Other Drugs, Turning Point Scotland. And lastly, uh, Roy Robertson, Professor of Addiction Medicine, University of Edinburgh, and recently retired as a GP uh, with over 40 years uh, practice. So um, we'll come on to the first speaker in a second, but presentations will be followed by a question and answer session and, and a panel discussion. My colleague, Austin Smith, will be monitoring questions as they come in and will join us for the Q&A and summarize questions being asked and, uh, which then will be put to panel members. So if I can start by asking our first speaker, Greg, to present. My name's, uh, as, as Dave said, uh, Greg Hill O'Connor. I'm working for the uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland in the iHub uh, around the programme that we, that's, that's about improving our response to, um, to people with, with mental health and substance use um, support needs. Um, so I'll, I'll go through a little bit about kind of what that is um, and, and some of the lessons that we found and then some of the thinking around, as, as David said, that, that kind of that challenge around implementation and how, how we're starting to approach some of these, um, some of these challenges. So in terms of the program overview, we're working with, uh, working with health boards, so we're working with Grampian, working with Greater Glasgow and Clyde, working in Lanarkshire and we're working in Tayside. With regards to MAT9 specifically, um, in Inverclyde, as part of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, we're, we're looking at implementation of MAT9. Within Lanarkshire, again, specifically North Lanarkshire, we're looking at the implementation of MAT9, and also in Tayside and Grampian. Um, 
in turn, and the program, the program aims, as you can see here, we've got the short, medium, and long term. It's fairly straightforward, and it's it's about developing the understanding of how things, the current system's working, getting the meaningful input from people, building an un, an understanding of of the challenges. In the medium term aims, we it's that ongoing lived experience uh, inclusion that we we, we want to see and to actively collaborate and um, plan. Um, and deliver joined up services. And then the long-term kind of outcomes really there is that, that people with digital diagnosis have better health outcomes, joined up services, equitable access, and the person-centered services. And essentially that reduction of harm. So we heard kind of what that, what MAT9 is, what the standard is. Um, and I was having a look through as, as kind of preparing this interview, uh, this, this presentation as kind of having a look at the, the, the specific criteria and I was looking at some of the key words around, you know, what it is that's needing to be done. And it's things like putting procedures in place, mechanisms in place, agreeing pathways, training, workforce development, communication, you know, things like this. And it's it's almost kind of having a look at where they are and, and bringing together the technical, cultural and relational parts of it um, and, and, and knitting this together in a way um that that makes sense and, and is coherent and i think therein lies some of the challenge in that a lot of the time you know it there's this idea of putting procedures in place but underneath that you know underneath procedures we all know this there's 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 cultural and technical challenges within that but there's also that relational challenge so it isn't just about um you know having the pathway it's about how you build those those relationships and how it works kind of operationally um and then, so some of the underpinning challenges. So uh, in Tayside, which is where we've been working the longest, we, we did quite a large piece of, uh, of engagement work, speaking with people um, around what they'd like to see um, from a, a joined up mental health and substance use service, and, but also kind of why and what the challenges are um, that, they've, that they've, they've faced. And, and these are the, the kind of seven kind of key identified areas. Um, and this is this is also prioritized. So we did it. We did a lot of work to to kind of put it into a bit of a um, uh, a list to, to kind of give that urgency um, back to the the health and social care partnership and the health board around what needs to be done. And it's that. And you you I, again, I don't think any of these will be particularly new to anybody. Um, but it's again, it's looking at that support when in crisis. The stigma and discrimination was was specifically um, called out. Uh, access and waiting times, communication, signposting, consistency and constitution to professionals, and then the lived environment. In terms of specifically towards MAT9, I think, again, one of the things that we're hearing is, is, is the, the, the crisis support. So it's, and even though, you know, that's not necessarily within um, the, the standard and within um, the, the scope of some of the procedures, coming back to that technical, cultural, relational, I think there's a, there's, there's cultural and relational underpinnings there that can be improved through the implementation of the MAT standards. Um, whereby, you know, because I think it's a common story of, of somebody seeking help um, for in, in a mental health crisis, but then being turned away because they've got substances on board. And that's kind of one of those key challenges that I think with the implementation of MAT9, some of these um, some of these kind of, yeah, again, these cultural and relational things can get unpicked and there can be a bit more of a kind of shared understanding about what support looks like in that setting. One of the key areas as well that I'll kind of come on to a bit is, uh, later on is the stigma and discrimination aspect. Again, it's, it's similar to that, but it, it's the idea of kind of not being welcome in certain services and certain spaces or being dismissed in certain uh, spaces, um, you know, because of I mean, usually it's with substance use that the stigma it, it comes in in terms of in, in mental health services from what, from what we've heard um but but it's it's across the board really i think um and so again i think in terms of the challenges and the implementation challenge i think some of these some of these underpinning challenges uh speak to to what that looks like because again it's you can have the thing you know and you can have the processes and paper and you can have the plans but there are still there are still some of these challenges. However, there's a lot of opportunities there as well, specifically with regards to communication and signposting, I think, as we'll see, is, is, is one of the key, potentially one of the key benefits of, of the, the, the standard nine. Moving towards implementation. So from all of that kind of understanding 
uh, the the kind of the context, one of the things that we're, we're looking at moving towards is understanding the scale of what's required to implement. So looking at strategic gap analysis, so looking at what the current capacity is. So where are services at the moment? What is what are the current processes and what are the, the existing pathways? Because we, you know, there needs to be there needs to be a clear understanding of of what the starting point is, to then look at where to focus. Because it's it's such a big challenge. It's in, and in many areas, it is likely to be transformational because there's there's you know some areas are, are ahead and in some areas potentially not. So we need to have that kind of shared understanding really, and and that gap analysis to see what can we focus on something about workforce planning which is a strategic plan advisor I'm, I'm very think is very important and it's that skills needs assessment so there's there is questions about even though you know there is that sense it is about referring and it is about kind of shared care but there is something around what what do, you know in order to do that and in order to enact the pathways and, and enact the standard what skills are needed but also there's a again this comes back to that technical cultural relational in terms of the cultural stuff there's something about collective responsibility and this is something that's that's come across with staff um, and with people is this idea of um holding risk and this idea of, of having this this person at risk and it's and one of the drivers for not wanting to support someone with something or or not wanting to um to 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 have shared care is that idea of 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 putting the responsibility onto a different service. Um, and so that idea of collective responsibility, I think is really important so that there is this sense of continuity um, and, and this whole system workforce. One of the big ones is, is legacy structures. So looking at, at governance, um, because in, in a lot of ways, it, it has been quite difficult to kind of move people towards, towards a consensus around what needs to get done because there are, various different groups there's various different strategy groups there's various different program boards um and it's looking at how how they how they join up and i think in terms of uh this this standard in particular it's quite interesting the conversations that we've been having because there's there are often kind of structures to implement map that sit very closely within um uh, addiction services and substance use services however it's it's kind of having that influence within the, the mental health structures as well is is slightly more challenging we found in terms of getting that that engagement and getting that buy-in so it's that trying to join up the governance so that that everybody's sort of talking to each other and that, again it, it's about that shared um shared kind of vision really something about aligning versus integrating so this is a bit more of a nuanced thing and it's it's you know for for a long time we've talked about we've talked about aligning priorities and, and things like that and and so there's something about streamlining the way in which, you know, our kind of levers of control. So how do we get things done? There's something about integrating those and streamlining those rather than just saying, oh, well, we're, we're working on this part of it and we're working on this part of it, you know, and we're working towards the same thing, but aligning, but there's potentially, there's more that can be done to kind of integrate and, and, and put them together. And then of course, there's people at the center and, and, uh, and I think this is this is key to a lot of it, I think, in terms of because I understand and we hear a lot about the pressure of, of the implementation. And again, because the way that the standards are worded, I think they've, they've, the criteria are very well done because it does make it seem achievable and it kind of breaks down the different elements of, of what needs to be done. But it's quite again, it's quite a process thing. And so it's important to make sure that that, that the people and the experience is not lost. So there is flexibility within the standards and it's looking at the flexibility of the implementation and where people can input into that and what it looks like and what it feels like. And that's responding to local need and experience. And so I think that's one of the key parts is because there is, because it is a national standard, I think there still needs to be that, that local thing that you can get from people. And, I, and by people as well, we are talking about workforce um, as well in terms of, 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 what's, of what's needed there. But again, that's the wider workforce, the whole, the whole thing. And so on that, one of the things that we've, we, we did in, in Tayside is, is we did a lot of engagement with people and we, we, we used this um, sort of model of understanding um, somebody's uh, experiences. And because the, and this helps us understand the referral dynamics, the wider context of services. So not just mental health and substance use, what, what else is in the picture in terms of someone? 
it's rooted in experience rather than process. I think this is something really important to highlight. Again, in terms of that moving towards implementation, it's when we're looking at what are the current processes, where we are now and where we want to get to, you need to understand it's not just where we are now in terms of what's written down, in terms of what should happen. You need to understand what does happen and, and, and what the dynamics of that is. But, and also looking at behavioral patterns with regards to access. So uh, it, to move away from that kind of paternalistic, you need to go do this, you need to go do that. And it's, it's understanding how people like to interact with services and how, and how that happens and what that dynamic is and building the processes around that. But again, I think that is a huge challenge. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, 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 that people are coming up against, which is, is difficult. So that's kind of a, a broad overview. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time because I can't quite see my clock, but I hope I'm doing okay. But basically the further reading we've got, um, we've got all the stuff here in terms of the Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, link. So that's basically the work that we've done so far and, and all the learning that we've done. And then the two, the two other ones are uh, recent reports that are out that I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, and you can sign up for updates on on all of our uh, all of our work, and uh, you can also feel free to to email me with any any questions or or comments. So thank you very much uh, for listening, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the rest of the, the contributors. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, that was a really helpful uh, overview of some of the work you, you're engaged in. I like the term uh, legacy structures, which uh, says an awful lot in a in two words um but we'll maybe come back to that uh, later can i ask our next speaker please now aaron menon to to uh to speak thanks aaron hi there thanks dave and thanks to everybody who's attended this hopefully constructive uh, seminar which i think has a lot of a uh, professional and personal interest um it's one that i've definitely been looking forward to myself um so um, I'm Aaron Menon. I'm lead clinician and consultant addiction psychiatrist in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I predominantly cover Northwest Glasgow and here in Sunny Kirk and Tillich in the base of the Eastern Partinger Service. Um, so I'll probably just provide a bit of a rant, dare I say it, in, in the nicest possible sense, and that is going to be quite a qualitative experience, a lived experience, dare I say, a professional experience of being an addiction psychiatrist and the 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 challenges, but also positives when it comes to trying to manage mental health needs in those with alcohol or substance use disorders. And um, this is obviously more about Matt nine, so it's going to be more on the substance use disorder side of things when we're we're talking about things. But of course, um, uh, this is obviously quite easily translatable into to any sort of um, uh, disorder or dependency. Um, when I volunteered for this, I was somewhat conflicted actually in my mind because there's a lot to be said about being an addiction psychiatrist, for example, and I see it as the best job in the world. I am unashamedly promoting it whenever I get the chance to do so. However, when it comes to things like mental health provision in, in our cohort, um, it probably provides some of the most more distressing aspects of the job and uh, nothing compared to what service users go through, of course, but um, the, the times when I have had to try and emotionally support junior trainees, for example, trainee consultants, dear say registrars, has been in scenarios where we're trying to provide care and treatment and for, for those with mental health needs, and we're struggling to do so. And that's, I, I assume, a little bit, but I expect that that's probably quite reflective of most of Scotland and, and the UK uh, as, as well, for lots of uh, different reasons, um, as Greg has actually touched on uh, in, in the previous uh, presentation. Um, and there's, there's obviously challenges on, on many aspects when it comes to mental health provision. There's the underlying stigma and discrimination and the labelling of, of having an, an addiction, as it were, uh, and, and how people perceive that in terms of providing care and treatment for, for mental health needs or mental health distress as well. But then there's the limitations in all the services as well, including our own addiction services, um, where um, we have very well-meaning and very benevolent uh, individuals who are trained in mental health. Um, who might not be able to either provide at the, the greatest extent what they can within their job role or don't have the systems and processes in place to do so. Um, so if I just focus on that maybe slightly initially, um, 
we we have you know many many services in Glasgow uh, has you know uh, mental health nurses for example who would be the the front face for much of the the management of mental disorders alongside care managers of all backgrounds who are excellent actually in managing mental distress through the experience of working with a lot of uh, service users that come through our service um they're ultimately I guess tasked to provide mental health inputs mental health assessments for example um man you know, um, coordinate when uh, when there's a mental health crisis alongside other more general mental health services. Um, however, of course, um, many mental health nurses are care coordinators themselves or care managers themselves, and and a lot of nursing staff, particularly, will be managing alcohol courts, for example, and providing both mental and physical health care and treatment and detoxes for that. And therefore, their their capacity or their ability to be bespoke mental health professionals, so to speak isn't quite there because of their complex rules as, as for all of us to be fair um but that does lead to a challenge when when you know again it's a it's a capacity issue a little bit and uh you know uh funding issues and all sorts of things like that but when, when you're asking a lot of our mental health nurses who are the backbone of of pro providing mental health inputs in, in addiction services um if they don't have that capacity to do so, then naturally that's going to be a significant challenge in terms of being able to manage a lot of mental health distress uh, or supporting prof other professionals who are trying to manage mental health distress and their service users. Um, and of course, that perpetuates a lot of trauma. Um, you know, people feeling very invalidated by experiences, as, as touched on by the, the the kind of example case report earlier. Um, feeling feeling somewhat neglected and rejected, and, and adding to to to. To their overall distress and engagement and outcomes ultimately uh, in terms of their own recovery and um, similarly which and this touches on other mat standards actually is obviously about trauma-informed care as well and psychological inputs and again that's a that's another significant aspect that that does align with with mental health inputs in terms of how we manage uh, uh, um the the needs of a lot of our service users as well i'll maybe save that for another time so to speak or for others to speak to um but you know there is a concerted effort i'd hope certainly locally in ggc where we're looking at trying to Train everybody to be able to be skilled at safety and stabilization techniques, for example, and to, and mindfulness and other aspects like that to manage mental health distress and trauma at a at a low intensity level, whilst managing addictions and then get into a point where they might be more appropriate for more intensive supports. Um, but I guess the main one, obviously, for me personally, would obviously be the psychiatry aspects. Um, and again, it's always a challenge when you're an addiction psychiatrist because you're a general psychiatrist by trade. But you're working in an addiction service which is much more hybrid health and social care backgrounds you're providing medical leadership and psychiatric oversight into a service that's predominantly about addiction um and whilst there's a lot of people obviously in our service that has mental health um distress and disorders and uh, not necessarily everybody's identified and you only see a small proportion of them um and probably much less than we should do give it again you know, capacity and uh, personnel notwithstanding. Um, the biggest challenge, which tends to be the elephant in the room when it comes to these things, is interfaces. Um, I've talked about internally our limitations, and I always tell trainees about the fact that we are not in commas a CMHT, and it's quite hard for a lot of people who've had no experience of addiction services at all in their professional training to really understand that until they've actually worked in a job. Um, however, that, that really does get reinforced when you're trying to manage mental health crisis. And again, there's so much undiagnosed illness that we're not picking up on or lots of mental health distress that we're not able to manage in the systems that we have. And then we do rely on our general psychiatry colleagues or other crisis services to manage this. And that's where a lot of tension can sometimes arise. And there's lots of reports. And again, it's been cited already about the challenges in between those accessing mental health services who have a substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder. And that, that does come through in our clinical practice too. Um, however, from my personal experience, at least when there's been, um, like, like with anything in life, I guess, good communication, good understanding of each other's roles, trust, it's almost common formed in itself, trusting each other that we are trying to do the right thing, shared shared interests in our service users and wanting the best uh, in a collaborative measure that, that we do have a lot of examples of good practice. Um, however, I guess the challenge is, and uh, you know, I'll defer a little bit to maybe the wider audience even about local experiences is that it, it still feels like pockets of good practice rather than that being the norm. I, I do feel that everybody benevolently has aspirations to, to work jointly together. 
but when 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 it comes to it in a way, it's always been a big challenge for it to actually translate into into that kind of a smooth, seamless practice when somebody's in crisis in an addiction service, for example, and then we are speaking to crisis mental health services, and then there's discussions about, well, is this person appropriate for, for assessment by the mental health services urgently, or whether they need a, you know, a sent off to a &E, which is less trauma-informed and uh, less patient-centered, as it were, or if the, or if uh, uh, a straight rejection. And I, as a general consultant, general adult psychiatrist, has referred directly in the past and had direct rejection of referrals, which is quite personal in a narcissistic sense. I feel quite hurt by it myself, but not least, again, for the service user who's clearly struggling with suicidal ideation or other, other really distressing feelings that they haven't got that neither I or they have, have a clear way of managing within, within our team. Um, there is hope, I would hope, and I guess just for the last couple of minutes, I should say that, you know, the reports are clearly highlighting it. I, there is a greater awareness within general mental health services as well as our own services about our own limitations and the need for development on, on in all services. There's talk about well-being hubs to manage mental health distress in general, at least in GGC. Um, we have an interface guidance. I, 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 you know, it's it's uh, it's a few years old now, and it's uh, and I, I, amongst others, are are planning to update it. But we do have a clear protocol, as it were, that we can rely on uh, to 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 interface between community mental health teams and and ourselves, as well as access to crisis services. And the, there's, you know, the, it can only be more future development through the likes of mass standards, anyway, and the and the and the. The rigorous observations that I'm sure people will be having on each local service about how we do provide mental health services. It's open to discussion whether we should become a CMHT, for example, as an addiction service, or whether we will always have our limitations as, as an EDRS, a, a local drug recovery service, in what we do in terms of mental health provision. Um, however, having joint working is, is, is clearly in the best interest of many people, particularly those with severe and during disorders, but actually with everybody. The fact that we, we in addiction psychiatry has a broader range of who we might see. We are, we are happy to see people with distress without disorder, so to speak. We are allowed to, happy to see inverted commas mild to moderate, though for everybody it's obviously severe, you know, in terms of the experience they have. All of these things are very positive things that can be translated, hopefully, into a wider mental health provision. But there's obviously a lot of work to do. But future development will be will be very key in a lot of things that we do in, in Standard 9. And there is a lot to do, I suspect, which everybody will have a strong opinion on. But I'm very conscious of time, so I will stop my ranting here. Um, I'll hand back to Dave. And thank you for having me. And enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank, thanks, Aaron, for, for, for that. That's really helpful. Um, description of some of the issues around the, the local challenges that uh, you've experienced and uh, it's good to hear the pockets of uh, good practice. Um, we'll now move on to uh, our third speaker, uh, Jan Mayer from uh, Turning Point Scotland. And over to you, Jan. Hi there, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you to Greg and Aaron as well. Um, and thank you all for being here. I've been asked to give a perspective from the third sector. So my role is in Turning Point Scotland, where we have um, a number of alcohol and other drug services across Scotland. Um, and we also have uh, homelessness services and justice services that also see a lot of people with alcohol and other drug problems. And I think that's important when we're looking at, at this uh, particular standard where those people who are, as, as Greg put it, working at those interfaces, uh, is, it's often the problem. Um, so the first thing uh, Dave asked me to talk about was highlighting the existing good practice. And I suppose uh, my instant response was, mm, there's not an awful lot. Uh, you know, I, I look back to Mind the Gap in 2003 and feel like not much has changed. And um, we have uh, we do have some very good partnerships that maybe fill that gap with psychology services in with some of our TPS staff in alcohol and other drug services. So those are um, services where psychology services are supporting TPS staff in their work with people who are using our services. Uh, and I have to say, none of those are in services where we're doing prescribing. 
out. So they're not really at the mat bit of the work, but they give us some hope for the future of a way of working um, where psychology staff have helped to train our staff in particular approaches and then provide ongoing supervision and support and consultancy around the people we're seeing. But as the slide says, there's more challenges than, than good stuff. So let's have a look at some of those challenges. When I'm um, when I'm our staff about working with people with coexisting uh, alcohol and other drug use and mental distress or mental problems, uh, can we just go back? Yeah, this one. Um, I, I I often ask the group um, which comes first the the which comes first uh, the mental health or the substance use or sometimes people ask me that and I throw it back to the group and ask them uh, what it is and often somebody will say well it's the chicken or the egg problem and that that comes up all the time um, and I what I want to say to you is I think I know the answer to the chicken or the egg problem I think I know the answer to this, and I'll tell you at the end of my little slot. But in the meantime, what I want to say is the biggest problem we see is that a lot of the other services are enforcing the binary between the chicken or the egg. That there is still a massive gap between the chicken of mental health services and the egg of alcohol and other drug problems. Um, so, um, if we, we move on, um, we pretend that this is a rare thing, that Matt Nine is talking about a small group of people, but actually all the research going right the way back shows that actually the majority of people using drug services have co-occurring mental health difficulties. Um, the figures are immense. Um, in a survey that was done uh, in the recent report, they found 76% said that the people had, uh, most of the people using their services had um, coexisting problems with mental health and drug services. We find that's even higher amongst the um, homelessness population and even higher again in the justice population. If you look at the UK figures, people with alcohol and other drugs problems in the justice systems, UK wide, around 90% have some levels of mental distress. So if we move on. Um, and one thing we need to think about is that shouldn't surprise us that actually using substances in our society is a normal way of regulating mood and that people with mental health difficulties of all types often have difficulties around regulating mood. So it's not surprising that they fall back on those cultural norms of regulating their mood. If we move on again, please. So the biggest problem for the third sector is this idea of cultural barriers of professional wariness. Now that phrase has come from a report that we're very shortly to launch um, on an evaluation of our overdose response teams. So not specifically about uh, working with people with uh, diagnosis of, of mental health issues, but nevertheless, the overdose response teams work with people who have had near fatal overdoses and there is often layers of mental um, distress in that or, or struggles with mental health. And one of the things that that evaluation report has pointed out is one of the key barriers to services working well is this culture of professional wariness, particularly, and it's not all statutory services, for some statutory services, there is a wariness of working with the third sector, of forming real partnerships with the third sector. And you might tell from my accent, I've spent quite a bit of time working in England. And one of the things I've noticed, I've had a long interest in this uh, working with coexisting problems. And one of the things I've noticed is, if anything, that professional wariness exists in both England and Scotland, but seems to be um, more stark in Scotland to, to my experience. So we don't get much interface between the third sector and statutory mental health services. Moving on. 
Um, so in other words, mental health services too often just see the egg. They just see the drug use. Um, this is from the uh, Mental Welfare Commission's paper that they published in September 22, um, ending the exclusion, care, treatment and support of people with mental ill health and problem substance use in Scotland. And they gave some, a couple of quotes from Scottish MPs that really struck uh, Scottish GPs that really struck me. Psychiatry locally give the impression that they do not accept the concept of dual diagnosis. It is common to see substance or alcohol issues listed as the principal issue and a plan for care by the addictions teams who are distinctly separate from the mental health team with no mental health team input if substance use or alcohol misuse is present. Um, another GP said if the patient has any substance abuse, the mainstream psychiatry services will automatically reject referrals. So there's this division as though the egg and the, the chicken are completely separate. Moving on. Um, and I think we have to admit there is still too much stigma amongst mainstream mental health professionals towards drug use and drug users. That's still around. And we know that that stigma is um, an underlying component in the current drug death crisis. And I think we in the third sector, often staff in the third sector, particularly in social care, feel that we receive some of that stigma too. We're stigmatized because we work in this field. Moving on. Um, the other thing I want to pick out is the influence of the fellowships in Scotland. So obviously, I want to um, reinforce that for those people who the fellowships are a, an important part of their recovery, they're fantastic and they're a fabulous part of their recovery. And some of the ideas from the fellowships taken out of the context of the, those fellowships can be problematic and be, can be a problem um, in terms of this interface of mental health issues and using alcohol or other drugs. So there's there's a strand within some of the fellowships that really emphasize the idea that you shouldn't use any drugs at all. And that leaks out of that environment to common sense and, and general practitioner practice. So again, from that same uh, Mental uh, Wellbeing Commission report, a quote from another uh, service user saying that when they asked the, for sleeping tablets, their GP said, I'm not your drug dealer. So there's this myth of the drug seeking behavior. Uh, and I've heard people say in meetings with Scottish government, we shouldn't give um, people who are addicts, not a word I would use, but used by some people in fellowships, any mental health drugs, because they will always be doing drug seeking behavior. They're just after the drugs. And that's a myth. That's not the whole story. I have certainly had people I've worked with who, because they've been told by somebody in their fellowship that they shouldn't use any drugs at all, have stopped anti-psychotic medication. Very recently in Turning Point Scotland, we had a situation where we had somebody who had been diagnosed with alcohol-related brain damage and was taking thiamine and again had been told by her sponsor from the fellowship that she should stop all medication. She stopped her thiamine and has now been diagnosed with Korsakoff's. Um, so again, th th there's a problem with this that we need to address on a wider, on a wider level. Um, moving on. Um, what I always say to the staff I'm working with is unless you're very convinced it will make a major difference to what you're doing, don't waste your assessment time on trying to solve this problem. That we don't need to get caught up as third sector workers in making mental health diagnosis. What we need to do is some kind of formulation that makes sense to the person. Okay, um, so I said I'd tell you my answer. Um, and my answer, going on to the very last slide, if you just go one more on, is it's the farmyard that comes before the chicken or the egg. So in other words, what people have in common is the causes of their mental distress and their substance use. And maybe that's where we need to be working together. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. That's a really helpful uh, way of uh, 
describing that and looking at the the, the issues around um, co-occurring uh, substance use and mental health. You also raised the issues around uh, GPs, and uh, that brings us nicely onto our, our final speaker, uh, Roy Robertson, who uh, will I think probably reflect more on his uh, 40 years of practice in Muirhouse than uh, his Edinburgh University work, but probably a bit of both. Over to you, Roy. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, I don't know if you can see me, everybody, but uh, thank you very much. And um, it's great to join you. Um, I, I have to say just how interesting it's been to listen to other presentations. I mean, it's uh, a lot of it resonates, especially uh, the clinical experience. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my clinical experience, like Dave says. Um, it's been a great pleasure and a privilege to work with people with drug and alcohol problems over the long period of time I've been um, in general practice. And uh, I, I can't understand people that don't find it a really rewarding a part of our work. But what I thought I'd do is I'd talk a little bit about two things. I thought I'd talk about the, the structure of general practice, because I think that is important to understand, you know, because that uh, once you understand that, you understand some of the difficulties and some of the strengths and weaknesses. Um, then talk a bit about implementation, about how um, services are implemented or could be or should be implemented. Um, so just on the structure of general practice, well, I mean, everybody thinks they know what GPs do. Um, I, I'm not sure if GPs know what they should do, but there is a uh, there is a, an un, uncharted territory of work that it falls into general practice core services. And core services are ill-defined. I mean, we do have a practice contract, obviously, we're, um, uh, we're uh, contracted to work with a group of patients, um, and the numbers of patients is quite clear. But income depends upon a variety of things. It depends on the number of patients, and it depends on, on the, the structure of the caseload. Um, and caseloads are different in different parts of, different parts of uh, Scotland. Um, but there are some services that aren't included in core services, and they're uh, sometimes funded separately, and sometimes they're not funded at all, in which case GPs can engage or not engage or choose to say to patients, no, this is not part of our core service, you know, you need to go to this or that agency or go elsewhere. And clearly, we don't, we can't do everything. Um, but when it's not part of the core service, there are added on contracts, uh, there are added on um, subcontracts to the main contracts. So, for example, specialist care services delivered in primary care are, are increasing. Uh, people with special needs, like people on dialysis, people who have um, complicated rheumatological disorders or and or, or on immunosuppressive therapies, which need to be monitored, blood tests need to be taken, all sorts of things which are additional to what we or what the core services would consider to be core GP work. Those are funded separately. So an enhanced service contract is negotiated and GPs can opt in or opt out of those, core, those enhanced service contracts. And unfortunately, drug and alcohol are not included as core service in, in any, in any well-defined sense although the overlap is, is terrific, of course, with all sorts of um, other parts of our regular work. So there is an enhanced service contract uh, for dealing with people with drug problems and for um, medically assisted treatments, and GPs can opt in or out of that, and a lot of GPs opt out of that. In fact, the minority of people in some areas of Scotland, and it varies from, from health board to health board, um, and the minority of people opt in to enhanced service contracts uh, for managing people with drug problems. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't manage the mental health problems, um, which clearly are core services, and nobody could uh, say that wasn't a completely part of the core service. So primary care is essentially delivering core services for people with or without drug use problems, um, and where there is an overlap, as there frequently is, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish one from the other. Um, most patients with complex needs, so, uh, their, their, their needs are 
various. Um, some of them are physical, some of them are mental health, some of them could be defined as drug and alcohol problems, uh, but they are all inextricably linked and have to be dealt with in the view of a generalist like a, a GP and a general physician. Um, we can't extract one from the other and they need to be dealt with together. And this in, in this lies one of the, the really important strengths of primary care. Um, so the new GP contract, I call it new, it isn't new at all, it's four or five years old now, but the GP contract includes a provision, a good provision, financial provision for inclusion of a variety of services within primary care, within general practice, actually within the building in most cases. So we have a lot of advanced nurse practitioners, we have physiotherapy, we have uh, mental health nurses now working in the practice, dealing with our caseload specifically. And this is, this is a, a great step forward. It's inclusive. It, it means that within the same building, within uh, a geographical area, we have a, a variety of services all designed and all able to deal with people with mental health problems. Um, and in terms of the practices that have enhanced service contracts, um, it can, depending on the model, um, it can include um, uh, drug workers within the general practice itself or a very close relationship. Um, so we have this close relationship with all our colleagues and, and I think coming on to implementation, it is good, I think, to see it as part of a, 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 an integrated structure to deal with people with drug, alcohol, mental health problems, and of course, uh, the other problems that people in, inevitably have, because um, we're dealing with people at all ages. Um, so that support from the enhanced service contract dovetails nicely with the core work, dovetails nicely with our relationship with our third sector colleagues, with our pharmacy, community pharmacy colleagues, and with our specialist colleagues um, who in most parts of Scotland work in the community. Um, I take the point of the last uh, speaker that there is this sometimes this distinction between um, drug and alcohol or between mental health and uh, 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 other mental health problems and uh, drug problems. Um, but in, in the view of the general practitioner, they are all closely interlinked. And I think with specialist services, there's an increasing move towards including drug, alcohol, and mental health services under the same banner uh, because they all occur in the same patient. So just in terms of, again, in implementation, um, that liaison, that relationship with colleagues and relationship with, with other services in the community is, is vitally important. Um, there are various models. Um, I'm aware that in parts of the west of Scotland it's different from where I've worked in Lothian and Tayside is different again. Aberdeen has had a huge development in, in using community pharmacists and supporting drug uh, problems. Um, and so th there are different models around the country. Um, I mean, our own model, which I think it describes very well what, what is a good model or what is a potentially a very good model is of an integrated care system um, where uh, a big, a large general practice like ours uh, with 20,000 patients has a close link with our local alcohol and drug services, regular liaison meetings, regular sharing of information um, on a face-to-face -face basis or more, more usually online nowadays. Um, on with individual cases being considered. Um, and we include in that group meeting, we include uh, community psychiatry, uh, community pharmacy, I should say, and we include third sector, and we include, interestingly, our uh, colleagues working in the criminal justice system um, and people working in toxicology and forensic lab uh, facilities in the local uh, health board area. So all these, individuals brought together to discuss individual cases, it seems to me to be a recognition that, uh, that drug services, drug problems don't exist on their own. Um, mental health services don't exist on their own. Uh, the overlap is almost inseparable. So just in, in terms of conclusion, um, I, I mean, we have got problems clearly, and we have a, an essential need to 
finance this system, which isn't, isn't necessarily financed um, in the core work uh, support that we get from health authorities. And we need ongoing education. And in, in my view, um, we need ongoing research. And I think primary care, again, general practice or primary care is ideally situated to work with the academic colleagues in providing data information and doing research. Um, just a comment on signposting. I, I, I mean, signposting is a, is a term that is caused some concern for all of us. I think we're, we're all used to signposting and saying to people, um, here's a better agency than mine to go to. Um, our view in general practice often is that signposting often goes around in circles and ends up back in core services again. So we need to be clear about um, who's taking which part of the organization. Um, so, but the positives are that primary care is essential. Oops, it's my timer saying stop. Um, the positives are that primary care is, is essential and well placed geographically and um, organizationally to manage mental health cases, including those in people with uh, drug related problems. We work with people with all ages and drug problems can clearly occur with people with all ages. We have some very young people um, with combined mental health problems and uh, drug problems. Um, we don't exclude anybody from the care if they're registered with our caseload, and that goes on indefinitely. So we have no discharge of cases. We don't say the case is closed and the patient has to go away or be re-referred. Cases go on um, indefinitely. And we work together with all agencies, and that's the essential part of how GPs work. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to work with all our colleagues. Thank you, Dave. Thanks so much, Roy. Um, I, I could now, if I ask all the, the panelists to uh, the speakers to, to come back. Yeah, we might come back to your uh, signposting uh, comment, Roy. Um, in terms of how that fits with uh, no wrong door um but uh, we might go around in circles with with that one um roy do you want to come back on camera thanks uh okay um so we've got uh 27 minutes or so for um q a and uh my colleague austin has now joined us as well austin do you want to uh kick off with the first question yeah, well, and just to say uh, the, the forum's still open in terms of questions. So if, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. When I, I suppose it might be useful uh, if we could talk about the, uh, the limits of professionalism. So to what extent are, are, do people just regard it as a professional boundaries not to engage with people who are using street drugs or people who are in, on medication in MAT or uh, to uh, or or, or to uh, people who are actively intoxicated. So, um, to what extent is that a barrier for for professionals or some professionals? And what do we do about that? Um, and what awareness do people have about people's barriers or or, or rules around that? Thanks, Austin. Aaron, do you want to have a shot at that first? Sure. Um... So yeah, um, it's probably the obvious answer, but I think a lot of us will will recognise that there is uh, challenges in terms of um, cl clinical perception of those with alcohol and drug use disorders and what it means. Um, where it comes from, I, I, I speak. I guess there's there's a few things. So I'll, I'll speak maybe medical first, really, and maybe partly nursing in this as well. Is that um, where is the training when it comes to alcohol and drug use disorders? It's so prevalent, but it's so such a small part of training, really. Um, if I think about, you know, undergraduate medical training at the moment, um, there's a psych block. Um, there may or may not be an addictions placement block or um, or a lecture even on addictions, as it were. Um, and then when for the people people's first, uh, unless they've had lived experiences themselves, or, or, or uh, you know, most clinicians first experiences of addiction might be when they do their first year of medicine as a, a foundation one doctor in an acute sector setting where there's a you know they see a lot of the, the the sharp edge when it comes to the distress associated with addiction 
but there's never any real solutions being considered and it's very much about oh, look, it's a you know, high expressed emotion get them out here kind of thing and i think that kind of perpetuates obviously the initial kind of instinct that a lot of clinicians might have about well okay this is something that is not for me in a way i don't take ownership over uh, uh, these kind of uh, difficulties as it were and then that gets perpetuated obviously when it comes into mental health and other things as well so maybe people might train to be a psychiatrist even general psychiatrist or any psychiatrist and and again the access to experience of addictions placements as a junior doctor or access to 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 management appropriate management alongside addiction services is again quite limited so people don't have the confidence to know what to do as well and and therefore don't want to take ownership over it or shared ownership uh, despite the fact that we we all should be as you know as, as, as psychiatrists at least and yeah so the vicious cycle continues because we all mentor each other and we are just perpetuating a lot of some of those thought processes around it i'm sure it happens in other health set circles as well maybe less so in other circles social care circles and others but i think that's one of the big challenges that kind of culture the royal college of psychiatrists just as a last point is trying to make changes from an addiction psychiatry perspective at least um it's now actively uh, requesting core trainees, those pre-psychiatrists as it were, to do two case reports as it were, addiction specific, and to talk to people in addictions about it. So that is a, is a kind of a reverse foot in the door aspect in terms of accessing us and understanding us and speaking to us and having a face to a service as well. So I'm hoping little things like that, and amongst other things I'm sure over, over the years to come, will actually develop a, an interest in being you know, managing things in much more holistically, understanding relationships between substances and mental disorders, and then doing good outcomes from it. Thanks, Aaron. Greg, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting one, and it's so I, you know I'm not from a from a clinical background, but just some of the things I've observed um, is is there is I you know I'd agree with Aaron that there's there is that sense of I don't know. And so there's a there's definitely a capacity and capability uh, challenge there, um, and and something that that does go back to that that medical students, you know, I I referenced it a little bit I because in in my presentation, but I think there really is something to do with with, and I think it is linked, but there is something to do with that reticence around around risk and around that notion of of clinical risk, and I think there's a big, I think it's a big cultural one, um, uh, more than more than anything else, because you know, from from what I've understood, from hearing people talk about risk, um, is that the, they don't necessarily mean risk to the patient. It's almost like risk that that I will that I am responsible for what happens to the patient, not whether something happens. And I, that might be doing a disservice. So I I don't want to sort of you know get under the skin of anyone because I you know it's it's a difficult job. But it, from from the engagement that I've done with staff, when when I've heard about risk that's that's the risk that i've i've heard been being described so i think that's that's a key part of it um i think and and yeah and i but that is underpinned by the reason that that is there as a culture i think is is exactly what aaron said in terms of that not knowing what to do um and not having that that skills and that those expertise which is something yeah. that i think needs to change and as, as you talked about in your presentation greg the sort of collective responsibility yep. um aspect to that as well uh jen do you want to you, you were nodding when greg was speaking yeah so I, guess. I just really echo a lot of what greg said there i think a lot of the fear is about about what the consequences will be for the professionals so there's a lot of fear that's true my staff my the the staff in turning point scotland feel they don't know about mental health so they're scared to talk about it uh, and and so uh, and, and likewise, our mental health colleagues are scared to talk about alcohol and other drugs. I think the only thing I would add in is I think there's something beyond the professional, which is the the deep levels of stigma around alcohol and other drug use across Scotland, and that that influences, you know, just the way. Uh, Aaron was talking about the way people are trained at, at very basic training level. Just the way people will hear that is influenced by the way they've been brought up in a society that holds that stigma. Thanks, Jen. Roy, of course, I was going to come to you as well, Roy. 
Well, thanks very much, Dave. I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think we've all got to be within our comfort zone, haven't we? And we've all got to recognise our own limitations. And um, and I think to to extend your interventions beyond your you know your 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 own skill is is a risk and is a danger. Um, but I think GPs, I, I mean, there's hardly a day goes past when you don't feel totally out of your depth or you're dealing with something completely new or something different. And that's part of the challenge, I think. Um, and the part of the solution to that is you're surrounded by, I always feel surrounded, supported by colleagues and by increasingly colleagues within the building um, to share and to, to learn from. Um, and to and and consultant and you know staffing colleagues throughout the NHS. So there's always somebody you can call upon to help. Um, but I mean, I, I I think there's you know there's very little you can do wrong in at least being having an inquiring mind and listening to people. And and I think the secret is to listen. And and I think the extraordinary thing for me is how much we learn from our patients, um, not just people with drug problems, but uh, you do learn almost every day, things that make your jaw drop and you'd never really thought about or you, you don't know about uh, from patients. And, and I think that process of learning from patients, sharing that with colleagues, uh, wherever they may be, is, is germane to our work. And I think it's inexcusable not to embrace all that. Thanks, Roy. Austin. Yeah, and the other one is, I suppose, is the extent to which people can be supported by specialists. So even people who have a diagnosis of, you know, a borderline personality disorder, or maybe people who are living with the consequences of, of trauma, um, to what extent do they need a specialist service and how much can other service providers be trained or supported to support those people? Thanks, thanks Austin. Roy, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I think it depends on your expectations, isn't it? I mean, you know, people with enduring mental health problems um, it can be out of control or can be in control, and Aaron knows is more about that than I do. Uh, but I mean, I mean, a lot of what we're dealing with is chronic illness or chronic disorders or chronic situations. Um, and to think that you're going to cure that in the space of a 10 minute consultation or even a half hour or a whole day consult is nonsense. And um, what we're dealing with is maintaining people and um, getting the best we can for them, helping them with day to day problems, you know, engaging with our all our wraparound services, you know, all these things that we have advocacy workers in the practice, we have people dealing with uh, uh, with homelessness and housing problems, you know, all these things are part of the service. So, you know, we're not, and, and that's part of this notion of harm reduction. We're not expecting, sadly, to make you cures every day. And we're dealing with uh, chronic situations um, and we're we're putting in a little bit of help or as much as we can. Um, so I think it depends on our expectations. And I think expectations have got to be within our own capabilities. And then beyond that, we go, we look elsewhere. Um, but I mean, that doesn't mean that we can't achieve quite a lot in, uh, you know, an incremental and day by day way. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Jan. Yeah, I, I agree that I think it is. I, I mean, I just really liked what Roy said there. I think it is about um, doing what we can in an incremental way. And I think it's really important that we are thinking about harm reduction. Um, I, I said in my presentation, I think maybe we we get over focused on the idea that there's a neat diagnosis that we then fix. And actually, maybe what we're talking about and what Roy put so beautifully there is what we're doing is helping people to manage their lives and live as well as they can with those complexities. Thanks. Aaron? So, yes, I, I would largely agree with um, my colleagues here. Um, I guess there's slight caveats in that. Um, again, it depends on what we're managing in terms of mental health, of course. Um, there's going to be a, I agree, in relation to trauma and trauma related illnesses, as it were, uh, then, yeah, absolutely. We, we need to be thinking about how, how, how we are providing that in the way that others have already said. Um, it's going to be much more. Is going to be much more agency and autonomy as well to the service user when it comes to that relative to other conditions as well, because trauma is about control and trust and you want to be able to give people the opportunity to have control and to feel 
trust in the process that they're going through as well. Um, when it comes to other illnesses, I guess, um, you know, schizophrenia of the world, for example, um, it will be much, or insight impairing illnesses, I guess, then it becomes a bit more complicated. We, we don't talk about that too much when it's been in addiction circles for the last, you know, few years, as it were. It's never quite really became public enough, I guess, in terms of our thinking, but I, we are seeing it. We, we, I know I have a very classic case in my own clinical practice where somebody's got a really quite complex schizophrenic illness really quite complex addictions issues, has no insight at all. It's really hard to actually initiate treatments of any sort, including MAP treatment, because he doesn't understand, you know, doesn't have the insight to understand the, the pros and cons and all of that. And there is that kind of risk, you know, there is that, you know, the aspect of needing to be a bit more paternalistic, dare I say it, Mental Health Act and other kind of, those kind of restrictive interventions that we have to do. And, and there will be a proportionality aspect where we do have to consider these things in certain conditions. So yes, um, I agree with the idea of, you know, needs-based care, uh, which I'm a strong proponent of in my own clinical practice. I hope I'm much more that than diagnosis, really, but it does depend on people's relationships with their conditions, uh, whether they want a label or not, and again, treatment or not. And I notice there's other questions about medical treatment as much as there's about psychological treatment here. Um, but also when it comes to the other conditions, we, you know, there is going to have to be that proportionality about where general and addiction services get involved and how aggressively they get involved in, in view of actually managing addictions issues in the longer run as well. It's the chicken and egg again and the farmhouse. Um, is the farmhouse the asylum? I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're, it's it, you know, that's the complexities of, of what we do and why we dare to say enjoy it as well. Thanks, Aaron. Craig, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think there's something around not seeing the this particular standard in in isolation from from the others. So you know, I noted that we're we're working around MAT six, and that's that that pathway between uh, addiction services and kind of well being support. And 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 I think one of the the challenges there in terms of kind of having that ethos of again collective responsibility is one of the one of the things that people have noted around the idea of, you know, seeking kind of smaller but potentially more ongoing interventions in, uh, you know, from either in the community or from from community organisations is then where's the escalation route should that need be? So if, you know, there might be that pathway between um, kind of high level mental health intervention and high level, well, high level substance use to high level mental health, there's potentially then the MAT6 pathway from high level substance use to sort of lower level mental health. But then is there, what then is the, are they going to hit a barrier if they then try and, and I'm making these hand gestures because if you look at the one thing that I found right, quite useful in the, the literature and evidence reviews is basically they've done a little quadrant basically around the different kind of combinations of potential need. And I think that's been useful in shaping how we think about where the challenges are, where the barriers to access might be, um, and to kind of stimulate some of the conversations around how people, you know, what people's journeys are as one, as they seek the support that they need, but also as the support that they need changes through through their, their sort of, through their life. Okay, thanks, Greg. Austin. Uh, um, I'm paraphrasing a question that's come in. <laughs> I come in about uh, Roy's description of uh, good practice in terms of joint joint meeting uh, to discuss individual cases as well as just to share information locally um, with a kind of multi-agency approach. And, and the question is, is this a pocket of good practice? I think we can presume, yes, it is. But so I suppose the secondary question would be, how do we make that practice more common? Roy, that's one definitely for you. You're asking me. I don't know. I don't know how you make it more common. I mean, I, 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 I think it is. It, it's not unique. I don't think. And I mean, I and I think there's various sort of ways that people do. I mean, everybody communicates with colleagues, and everybody communicates on a case by case basis. Often, you know, case conferences are common. And but I mean, these joint meetings I found really engaging and really empowering because they give you confidence and they give you confidence to share your mistakes and share your positives. And 
and and also you know when it comes to things like drug related deaths we talk about drug related deaths you know we say what have happened to this person and could we have done better could we have you know is there something we could have done and sadly often we find that we can't you know there was there was a sort of inevitability about some of these deaths um, but that in 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 its sense is is good for us because we you know we we're encouraged and we don't you know we're not blaming ourselves for failures um, which are out with our control. So I think all these things, and I, again, I'm just espousing a model of uh, how we might proceed, but uh, how you implement that across health boards, I'm not sure. I mean, we have a, a, a sort of um, structure, a facilitator team in Lothian, um, which really is very supportive again, which monitors and, and supervises the enhanced service contract. And, and that facilitates this, these sort of meetings. And I, I think that's an, an additional factor that every health board could, you know, could fund and could um, uh, arrange. Uh, but, but you're right, there are different practices or even within our health board and certainly in other health boards. And I'm not sure quite how you, you know, how you, you create a model. Thanks, thanks Roy. Um, I just want to leave enough time for, I suppose, a question around, um, all the issues that was you know, highlighted in all the reports around, you know, we have all the guidelines and protocols and everything else, but we we don't have, you know, the integration and the no wrong door that all of those reports suggest we need. So my question sort of in two parts, firstly is if we were starting from scratch, would we have our services organized the way they are? And then secondly, on the basis of how we currently organize our services, what do we need to do differently to, to change things. Um, now, I, <laughs> I've given, I think, Jan, when we discussed this yesterday, a little bit more warning. So I'll, I'll go to Jan first, if that if that's OK. Um, if we were organising services right now, would we do it like this? No, no. And I, I, I think we could think much more radically about that. And I know that that, it, you know, the idea of having alcohol and other drug services mental health services, homelessness services, criminal justice services, that are all dealing with the same population is actually a bit crazy. And it, it's the way it is now. But, you know, two centuries ago, we didn't have psychiatrists working in this way. We had shamans and priests and we can organise this differently. Uh, and I think we, we, we wouldn't start from here. But given that we are starting from here, what I would um, like to see is much more early workforce development across those professional divisions. So social care and health being trained together on particular topics. That's what's working well with the psychology departments in NHS Scotland that we, we in Turning Point Scotland are working with. So um, we could all be trained in trauma informed together in mixed groups and get to know each other as human beings at early points in our training. That would be my, my one big thing we could change, workforce development. Thanks, Jen. Greg. Um, I think um, I think the answer to the first question will, will always depend on I guess how I feel. Um, I think the the potentially um, this kind of links back to the farmyard idea, but for services, potentially if we were to start again, it would we we would do things the same way, not out of choice, but I think potentially because some of the fundamentals are there in terms of of you know a lot of the culture is driven by external things like demand and the the stress that that causes resources and the the challenges that that, that causes the the rest of the 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 environment in which people are living um i think are, are, are kind of lead into a lot of this so potentially there's an argument to be made that that I'd, yeah but that, that's potentially more provocative than it needs to be because i think i think ideally you're you're right that one of the things that is is just wild is 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 how it is a small, a relatively small cohort of people, um, and it's it, it and these services are seen the same ones, and they and they know that, and they they talk about it as such, but there are the processes and procedures sort of there are just there are a lot of barriers in the way, and so I think yeah, going back to that idea of the workforce 
and that idea of collective responsibility, I think that would be the one is where you have, again, you know, you have just, you wouldn't need to have integration because you'd, you'd grow it together, I suppose, is the thing. And so the challenge that we're having at the moment is that integration. It is the clashing of, of quite old and established structures. And so I guess from my sort of planning point of view, that is the thing that, that needs to be sort of focused on. And that's quite a multifaceted piece. But I think that kind of um, that melding of all the, 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 the different kind of governance arrangements locally um, around mental health and substance use, I think would be a, a really important bit to focus on. Thanks, Rick. Roy? If you look around the world in a bit, for a better model, it's hard to find one, I have to say. You know, you, looking at Europe, um, there's a lot of variety. I mean, some of the Swiss model of care is, is great. And I know, Dave, you've studied that extensively in the past. And the quality of care and the integrated services that are provided in some of these clinics is, is fantastic and extends well beyond what we do and what we are at the moment funded or, or legally allowed to do. Um, so there are models that are attractive, but most of them are less attractive than ours, quite honestly. And most of them are trying to invent what I think is, is our primary care model. They're most of most people are trying to invent a harm reduction model that could be in communities, extend as wide as possible um, to as many people as possible, rather than just selecting people with the most serious problems or you know, dealing with people with, with um, advanced uh, addiction or alcohol problems. And um, so I think it is hard to find a better model. I, th I think what we could do is exclude some of our political interference and you know, let the services run without reorganizing all the time and without um, having politicians telling us what we should and shouldn't do. Um, I mean, I think uh, you know, our education services, I think Aaron's quite right, need to be enhanced. We need to get better training at undergraduate and postgraduate training and research level. But I mean, I think if these systems that we have in place were funded properly, um, then they could work really much better than anywhere else I've observed around the world. Thanks, Roy. Um, I'll, I'll bring in Aaron in a second. Uh, but uh, certainly, I think, uh, you know, there, there are different models. Certainly, the, the Netherlands is quite interesting in that the third sector commissioning is actually uh, certainly a few years ago when I looked at that was across the board in terms of criminal justice, homelessness, uh, drug and alcohol and mental health. Um, but they delivered more of those their services in the, in the third sector. So you, you have the opportunity to commission that, I suppose, in a way that is more um, coherent, if you like. But how well that works, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, but we've only two minutes left. So Aaron, you have the last word. Oh, dear. Um, so um, I get the question and insinuates that there is an, an end point in this. And I guess I would have the general opinion that, you know, everything's an evolution in a way. Um, I have a psychiatrist friend in France, for example, and um, she gives me all the stories about French psychiatry and addictions. And it mortifies me, quite frankly. So I'm not saying we're good at all, obviously, but um, wow. Could it be different in other developing developed countries, actually? Um, but yeah, in terms of our situation, I mean, it, yeah, we've evolved to this point. It's clearly not quite working, but we're, you know, we're, we're talking about developing what we do within addiction services, at least when we're talking about MAT9. But we're obviously not only one cog amongst many, many, many cogs otherwise, and you're expecting other services particularly, I guess, in my case, general adult psychiatry to actually evolve at the same rate as we are. And that's going to be a challenge in itself. If we're going to be changing our practices, we are then changing our rules and remits, for example, and then that will have an impact on other services that you have to change as well or, or the other way around. Um, I like the fact that in, in some respects, I like the fact that we do mad standards and it's about principles. And I guess I wouldn't be looking to find a perfect service as such, but I'd be looking for principles that allows us to develop a service that can be quite flexible, responsive, person-centered, trauma-informed, that we can deal with all needs. Because we're, you know, we're at the moment in the Valium crisis, so to speak. Cocaine seems to be coming up quite quickly. And, you know, it, things change all the time and we all have to constantly change as well. But if we have the systems and processes in a, in a place that allows us to change uh, in, a, in a positive and not in a particularly distressing way for both service users and for those that work in it, then we're we're on for a winner, really. If I was to give you one practical um, a, uh, suggestion, I guess, in terms of maybe improving things, um, I'm sitting here in Kirk and Tillich. We are in a health and social care um, building. Uh, therefore, general psychiatry is just 
down the corridor and primary care somewhere else and other services there. You know, the fact that we're in the same building means that we can talk to each other face to face rather than receive a referral, have that impersonal kind of uh, reject disappears never you know and, and then we don't have those kind of communications whereas you can have the water cooler com conversations when you're in the same building uh, in glasgow services it tends to be in in different sites as it were in general psychiatry and you know or mental health and, and addictions and therefore you don't have those relationships that we we aspire to so if there was one practical thing i would do is, is to get us all lumped together in a nice way but give us enough rooms we never have enough rooms okay thanks thanks aaron that's a good point to, to end on um, we've come to the end of today's uh, webinar. Finally, I'd like to thank you all for attending and staying to the end of the, the, the webinar. And of course, a special thanks to the presenters that I think you'll agree uh, have provided really interesting and uh, provocative uh, presentations that will help us um, in terms of effectively delivering uh, MAT Standard 9. So thanks again and uh, goodbye for now and hope to see you again next week. Bye.